Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. -on -One. Singularity One-on-One -on -One is a regular feature of singularityweblog.com where you can go and download it or listen to it in full. Today, my guest on the show is Natasha Vitamur. Natasha Vitamur is a PhD researcher at the University of Plymouth, a theorist and media designer. She has been referred to as the first female philosopher of transhumanism, a spokesperson for super longevity, and a superhuman object of desire. <laughs> Natasha is best known for designing primo post human, future human prototype, which project applies nanotechnology, biotechnology, artificial gender intelligence, robotics, neuroscience, and advanced medicine. She is a visiting lecturer at more academic institutions that we have time to list here. And she's also the former president of Extra P Institute. She's currently on the board of directors of Humanity Plus, fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, advisor for the Singularity University, Lifeboat Foundation, Alcor Life Extension Foundation, and visiting scholar at 21st Century. Her writings have been published in numerous books, she has appeared in more than 24 televised documentaries and has been featured in magazines including the New York Times, Wired, and many others. So without further ado, let me welcome Natasha on the show and say, welcome, Natasha. It is a great privilege to have you on Singularity One-on-One -on -one here today. Thank you. I am absolutely delighted to be here, and I'd like to meet this person. She sounds fabulous. <laughs> you know, when you don't think about yourself in these ways. Um, so when I, I listen to you, I'm going, oh, I have done something meaningful with my life. <laughs> so thank you for reminding me of you know, some reasons why I ought to feel good about my work and um Thank you. That's sweet. Well, thank you. It is our pleasure. You have done many meaningful things, and uh, they would be the topic of our conversation here today. But before we actually start looking at the specific accomplishments, let us go a little bit further back and start at the beginning. Um, how did your interest in philosophy and technology in general came to be, and how did it move on to issues such as the technological singularity and transhumanism in particular after that? You know, it's, it's an interesting narrative, and, and like everyone else, I have my narrative that um, caused a difference in my life or a change in my life. Uh, to be precise, it was in 1979. I was living in a ski resort in Colorado called Telluride, and I was a little bit of a jet setter. I owned three businesses, a house with... Um, uh, two partners, and I lived a very lovely lifestyle, but I knew something was missing in my life. Interestingly enough, Telluride has many different festivals, including the Telluride Institute um, Technology and Science Festival. And in 1979, um, the Lifton Zolines and Richard Lohenberg put together a project called Arts and Sciences 79, in, um, which was funded in part by the National Endowment of the Arts and the Telluride Institute. And at that festival, I was invited to be one of the speakers, and I was a painter at the time and performance artist. I was invited to, to present. I was so stunned by the quality of other people there who were involved in technology and science, and I realized there's this whole world that I hadn't even thought about. So um, in regards to the, the robotics, virtual reality, um, um, synthetic virtual environments, and this is in 1979, so the human computer integration was, was fairly new in the arts, and Harold Cohen was there, and Harold Cohen is, uh, the first artist to use artificial intelligence and robotics in his work. So, lo and behold, I met Harold and, um, a number of other astute artists and scientists, and my life changed. I moved to Los Angeles, I became involved in the film industry as both a, a designer and a theorist and performer, and I kept on turning more towards technology. And I left the film industry because it was so far behind in technology. Um, most of the films were dystopic, science fiction, great, great themes, great um, animation, great direction, great use of technology in films, but it was the theme, thematically, the science fiction films were... Um, not where I wanted to head. So I kept on turning the corner and looking for a community of people 
of uh, intellectuals, um, thought leaders within the future, and especially looking at humanity and what we could become. And I ran across an idea called the transhuman. And in 1983, I wrote the transhumanist art statement, uh, setting uh, a principle or a set of tenets about uh, what we could become if we could live longer, if we could enhance our physiology, if we could augment our brain. Um, so it, it de- developed there out of cybernetics and second-order cybernetics, and I haven't looked back. So it's, it's been a continuous journey to find um, not only the sciences and technologies which could help us develop um, a future of numerous potentials and solve a lot of the problems we have today, such as environmental problems and problems with the human psychology and mental, mental illnesses, etc., and human physiology, disease, and death, but also looking for a, uh, a set of visionaries who not only understand this but want to be the uh, purveyors of these ideas. So I feel very fortunate that I um, did meet a lot of futurists and scholars of uh, human enhancement uh, sciences and technologies. You know, I was reading, uh, as part of my preparation for this interview, I was reading your manifesto, and the last two lines of it, if I can remember, were saying something like, as our tools evolve, so shall we. And that very much reminded me to uh, an interview I did with Kevin Kelly a couple of weeks ago, uh, and in his book, What Technology Wants, he says in one place that human is a process, it's not an entity. So I thought, hmm, that's very much the same idea, I think, about the, the constant evolution or progress or change or or sort of a, it's not a finished entity, it's an ongoing process. No, it's not. And I, I think Kevin Kelly's book, I'm reading it right now, it's, it's really a, a stunning book about the history of, of human. And uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see how he not only packages the idea of what technology wants, but he prefaces it in the evolution of our, the hominids. So it's, it's an exciting book. And another element here, which I, I'd like to just mention, uh, three years ago, I think it was maybe two years ago, I gave a talk at the Artificial General Intelligence, or AI, conference put on by Ben Gertzwell at the University of Memphis Mm -hmm. at the Federal Express Foundation there. And my talk was uh, about intended consequences. And I was looking at artificial general intelligence as a technology that if we're going to build, we ought to put ourselves in the position of the potential of AGI and think about what it wants. Um, I was criticized a little bit for this talk by a couple of AI folks because they didn't understand a strategy and um, scenario planning and the systems analysis. But if you want to understand technology, you have to not necessarily anthropomorphize it, but you need to put yourself within the, the system of the technology and consider, well, if I was this technology, oh, hypothetically, what would I want to achieve my goal? And it helps you take a look at what some of the intended and unintended consequences could be. Absolutely. So. But let me go back to one interesting detail of your biography. Uh, if I get it correct, you were actually first an artist and a performer and a, and a business person before you yes. actually became interested in, in philosophy and, and technology and transhumanism. That is correct. So how, that's quite a, substan- a, a fundamental almost like change in, in worldview and in, in activities, in, in vocation, I, I would imagine also in lifestyle even to a certain degree. Uh, how did you come about this change? Was there something that pushed you towards it or how did it happen? You know, it's, it's interesting. I think part of my psychology is to change and to create um, – explorations where I have to find out who I really am. You know, you, we uh, talk about the walkabout, you know, um, a term used for the Aborigines in Australia or mm-hmm. even the Navajo Indians. They, they send their young male youths on quest to have a vision about who they're going to become in their life. I take that very seriously. And as an artist, it's always been part of my particular um, palette of tools. I've done this a number of times in my life. Um, 
I remember when I was 20 years old, maybe 21, I had been at the University of Memphis in Memphis, Tennessee, and I went to high school there in Memphis from New York, which was an interesting change. But I was a model and um, in a number of beauty contests and um, uh one of the the women of the South that was, you know, like the queen of the fraternity and the sweetheart of this and that. And it was so offensive to me. I mean, it, it was fun and exciting and, you know, it built the ego. But I left there um, at 20, maybe 21 years old, and I went to live with the Navajo Indians. And that was a total change in my life from being in this high-end social, you know, evening gowns and cocktail dresses on the weekend to going to... I dressed like a boy, I had long braids, I was totally androgynous, living with a medicine man and his wife who ended up being the uh, foremost Navajo um, uh, shamans. I'm sorry, uh, I lost the sound there for oh, a second. The, the foremost Navajo shamans of the Navajo kingdom. That was a change. I did it again later on when I went to Italy to study. And leaving Telluride, going to L.A., to the film industry from this beautiful environment, and from going from an artist um, who's a performance artist and a painter to going into technology and philosophy was a shift. But if we look at the arts, most artists, and perhaps this is a generalization, but let's just take a look at it, for example. Painters become film directors. Mm -hmm. And if we look at it that way, the painter wants to walk into his or her painting. To sit in a studio and paint is a wonderful experience, to be sure, but it often gets rather lonely, and you're there with your canvas. For example, there's a painting. I'm sorry, um, something's I, happening. The, the voice is, is gone again. Oh, sorry. The, the painting behind me is, is one of my paintings. I Oh, here, let's oh, there try you go. this. There you go, oh, yeah. It's back. Okay. It's back. I uh, think the, there may be a loose connection somewhere. Okay. Uh, just stop me any time it, it goes out. Okay, but the yeah, because you're saying so many interesting things that I don't want them to be lost. Oh, okay. So I'll back up here just a second. A painter is alone in his or her studio with a vision that's in one's mind, and we, we take it from our mind and we put it through the chemistry of the, the oils onto the, the canvas. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, a painter wants to go to the next level, where the painter wants to see that image moving. Mm -hmm. So the next step would be filmography. So um, oftentimes, if you look at a film director, he or she had been a painter in earlier uh part of their career. Now we see lots of graphic designers going into animation because you want to see that image move. Um, so it's, an, it's a natural ne uh, progression to want to see that image that we portray that comes from the mind into the canvas move and even talk and communicate with an audience. So that is a natural progression. Along with that, part of the progression is having a a theoretical viewpoint to having a message that one wants to um, state. So rather than being a stoic painter, the more performance artist in me took over. And performance art is certainly based on happenings and capro and whatnot, but the performance artist is performing because he or she has a message, and it's usually sociopolitical. Most performance artists have... Um, had an ideology that wanted to spread or, or cause some kind of ludic or irony on society to do a happening in the middle of nowhere, like in the Grand Central Station in New York or in an alleyway. But um, once uh, multimedia started becoming more important for artists to document our work, we started going more into the written word and writing more manifestos and actually lyricizing our, our paintings. So it's a natural progression. Now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, when I got into transhumanism, meaning human enhancement and radical life extension, it seemed almost uh, paramount to, to have a vision that is expressed in words. Um, and along with that comes activism. If you're an activist, you've got to speak up and, and say what you believe in. So it seemed a natural course for me to go from the, the image and the silence of the image to through performance, through becoming more philosophically inclined in addressing some of the issues that face us today as a human species. I think it's definitely providing a much fuller and complete picture and 
and and and the whole spectrum of 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 completeness both on the emotional end and on the sort of logical uh mm, logical hardcore thinking end but that's the rarity of, of your case i think because usually most people are either very logical and uh very not artistic like for example me or very artistic and not so logical right and yet you're one of those rare cases who's combining both which is which is really interesting i think so so let's let's move on along your story then um so then you start being involved into issues of transhumanism and radical life extension and the philosophy behind those um what is your motivation uh, first of all let's let's break it down like this so what is your work what's the essence of your work nowadays what do you do exactly <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. What I'm doing right at this moment is I have a rose garden. I've uh, become a, a bit of a, um, a connoisseur, I suppose, an amateur connoisseur of uh, plants. I, in this particular house that we built, I planted 28 trees, a number of bushes. I have a rose garden with seven different species, and I just started a, a bamboo garden. So I suppose that that's part biological art if you want to look at it that way as a field. Um, but more seriously, based on my particular practice, I have been working with a design called Primo Post Human for the past 10 years, and I keep on reinventing it um, as agreeing with Kevin Kelly, we're a process, we're a work in progress. So uh, so to our, our, our ideas. And as an artist, my practice keeps on growing. Uh, Primo Post Human, as the, um, the original future human prototype needs to keep on evolving because the technology keeps on evolving and the sciences as well as the ethical issues and the, the ideology and the uh, issue of um, stem cell cloning and genetic engineering and who are we in identity and all the uh, philosophical rigmarole around it. So I, I still am with Prima Post Human. I'm looking at new stages of it and trying to um, create it as a a narrative for uh, humans to understand rather than making it so totally cyborg-esque, which is a bit of a turn-off when we, we think of the cyborg being metal human. I'd rather it be humaneness, um, transhuman, towards post-human. I'm also very interested in working in um, the area of uploads, which is substrate independent minds, or another term is whole brain emulation. So I'm doing a, a fair amount of research in that area and considering how that fits into human enhancement and how that fits into my primo post-human design. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also continuing to work in bio arts or biological arts. I did a project called um, Bone Density, uh, last year, um, based on my bone density and reversing bone loss, uh, most women and men would be interested in that project. And currently, the project is um, neurotransmitters, working with my brain and taking a look at some of the degeneration in my brain or the white matter that we really don't want too much of. But most of it is a natural process of aging. So I'm looking at not tremendously reversing that because... That would be impossible, and if I knew how to do it, I'd be a multi-billionaire. <laughs> but um, so I'm, I'm looking at what sciences and technologies and advances are coming about that would help us keep the plasticity of our thinking, of our cognitive capabilities going. So plasticity is important there, as well as um, looking at MRIs of the brain and considering what... Um, um, methodology to use to try to increase the dopamine in the brain, to um, look at serotonin uptake inhibitors, of course, but mm -hmm. to increase the plasticity. So, so let me ask you this then. You have such a diverse background. You have a whole spectrum of interests from rose gardening to uh, white matter in the brain to uh, enhancing the human body and radical life extension to art. Uh, so who is Natasha Vitamur then? Are you an artist? Are you a philosopher? Are you an academic? Are you an AI researcher? Are you, how do you see yourself primarily? You know, it's interesting. I really don't see myself as an artist anymore. I, you know, when, and, 
I think when, when people think of the term artist, they associate it with a painting hanging on the wall. And while painting is fun, like the painting behind me, I enjoy doing that, and I enjoy doing large paintings for my home. But um, I, I suppose I'm more of a... Um, uh, I don't know what I am anymore. <laughs> I, Europe maybe I'm in a new meant. field that isn't defined yet. Maybe it's um, I'm a cross-disciplinaritarian or a transdisciplinarian of um, the sciences, technologies, and, and media art. I, I okay, I'm a designer. I think that says it all because if you're a designer, you have you're skilled in the arts. You understand uh, the practicality of the arts. Um, Sorry, I lost the sound there again. Oh. Okay, is this better now? No. Okay. Yeah, back, back, okay. Back. So, um, I suppose I'm a designer because design incorporates arts, the fine arts, uh, and the sensibility and, and the, all the different art theories. And it also incorporates science. So, design has to be based on solving a problem. And where art, per se, doesn't have to solve a problem. Yeah. Uh, and I'm more interested at this point in my life in, in problem solving, so I would have to say I am a designer. So that's a rather engineering approach, wouldn't you say? Because engineers are problem solvers, right? You have a, a river and you need to find the best way of crossing it and you build a bridge and you solve the problem. So you have the problem of death, for example, then you're looking into radical life extension technologies or aging, as you've mentioned before, and all kinds of ways to, at the very least, slow aging, if not defeat it. So isn't that a very engineering approach? Yes, I, I, but I think that engineers would probably be offended a little bit to think that an artist who is a designer would assume that he or she is an engineer because, remember, engineering is based on mathematics. And uh, like architecture is based on mathematics. Mathematics and I are not good bed partners. I am slightly dyslexic, and when I have to do math, I one, two, three, I'm counting on my fingers. So it's, um, I don't have that aptitude for math, so I'm not an engineer. Um, whereas a designer is, um, deals with, um, you don't have to know math, but you do have to know the coordinates of design. And you're looking at... Um, the bigger picture. Uh, a bigger picture, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like Bucky Fuller, who was an architect, yeah. was a um, an astute uh, designer because he understood the world game plan. He understood what was the problem in the world and sought to uh, solve that problem. And at his time, the problem was distribution of foods. So he went about to develop the world game plan to, to solve that problem, which mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, government um, and... Um, Big business or whatever uh, didn't have, hold that in high regard. So we still have our problem with distribution of food to the pe many people in the world who need food and water, which is very sad. But um, so I think design is is probably the area where I fit best. That's very interesting, and, and I'll actually take a a, a a a line from your issue here about the the lack of success in terms of distributing food globally. Uh, so what is your motivation? Because I'm, I'm kind of sensing a bit of a humanitarian in you there, maybe. So is your motivation humanitarian? Is it ethical? Is it moral? Is it religious by any chance? Is it just a sort of a scientific curiosity of pushing the envelope and, you know, or enjoying the journey, taking one step at a time? My motivation is is deeply innate, and it's it's based on um, a deep sadness for um, a life force that is riddled with so many problems. I look at life as being just this beautiful gift of being in existence in the moment, um, not in a, from a Zen perspective, but also the, the laughter of life and to, to spread connections and, and curiosity and humor um, and intelligence. And I look around it at the anger and dystopia and aggression of humans and uh, the, the uh, people who are... Um, 
you know, have a, a horrible disabling diseases. Um, and so it, I have a deep sadness about that, and I, I don't think that that's the way it ought to be. <laughs> I think it's as, as common sense as that. Sorry, I have an itch on my nose. Um, but when I see this all around me, and I know it could be better, then it's an innate desire to want to be part of whatever school of thought or ever activists or action plan that can try to make it better. And I mean this strictly in the areas of disease and debilitation, mm-hmm. uh, the aging process of Alzheimer's and senility and brittle bones and um, osteoporosis and crippling diseases to, you know, children and uh, younger adults. Oh, there we go. Uh, younger adults who have... Um, just horrible diseases and anguish and pain and sadness. Um, I just don't think life has to be like that. I think life can be better. I look at my rose garden, my bamboo garden, and my trees, and I nurture them. And sure, they get insects and whatnot that feed off of them and, and destroy the flowers and the buds. But it's a constant process of balance and, and trying to stop the, uh, the um, entropy and try to prolong life. Um, so, so. I suppose it's humanitarian in a way, but um, I'm not a hum- big humanitarian. In uh, I'm a trans humanitarian, I suppose. Yeah, that's uh, that's I think something that uh, Kevin Warwick would probably say. Uh, but I I do feel that compassion at the very like at very very clear compassion. It seems to me. So I want to also ask you. Uh, do you have any religious uh, affiliations, past or present? And how yes. do they impact on your work, on your ethics? Yes, I do. I was um, baptized and confirmed a uh, Episcopalian. I went to church just about every Sunday with my family, my parents and my siblings, up until I was about 18. And one day I took a look around me and I thought, I am tired of men telling me what to do. It was always a man preaching at the front of the church, and it it offended me. And so I left. I became a, a universalist, a Unitarian universalist, and I because it was more humanitarian. Um, and I practiced that for a number of years, and then I um, lived with the Navajo Indians and explored their religion and mysticism and lore. Um, study different religious beliefs around the world um, to develop my own synthesis and synergy of, of what, why we need beliefs, what they do for us, what we can do for them, how they evolve, and, and are they really necessary? A Zen seems to be the strongest belief I hold, not as a Buddhist, but Zen as far as you know, Zen of life, being in the moment and just the, the uh, focus of life, you know, the, it's not a piercing focus, but a, you know, a, a clean perspective of, uh, cognizance of being there, you know, when you're alert and aware, but also relax. So it's peace of mind is, is crucial to me. Today I hold no religious belief. I think religion is, uh, not a healthy thing for, for, uh, a society because it has dictums and rules and regulations and it's I'm right, you're wrong. And I think that whole sensibility of one group of people being right and another one being wrong, when you have so many diverse views, some, something's, something's not working here. So, um, I find that very difficult to deal with. Um, I do get a little bit offended when people profess their religious beliefs to me based on the Bible and take it literally. Um, and I have some people I care about uh, deeply who do this and, and base, they'll say such and such, well, it says in the Bible and God and he says this and we, you know, and I, I that, I mean, also I step back because who wrote the Bible? Oh, how many people wrote it? Um, and I think it's a, um, Christianity, of course, like many religions, is is healthy for so many people, and it does have have great value to it for so many people, but not for me. Um, so I think the strongest belief I hold now is uh, kindness and love, <laughs> and and cognitive plasticity, <laughs> keeping the mind active. <laughs> that's that's great because I mean, 
to a large degree, this is very, very similar to how I feel. I mean, I, I consider myself atheist on most days, and on a, if I'm incredibly flexible on that specific day, I may say I'm an agnostic, but that's really pushing it. And But Zen, on the other hand, is the only religion, quote, unquote, that you can be an atheist in. And you can have the sort of mind of no mind and embrace it and just go along with the laughter and without embracing any specific deity. And I, I find that that works for me. So I, and, and it's also a lot of fun. There's no dogmas. It's, it's very liberating, I find. Mm -hmm. So, so I totally, uh, associate with, with what you just said. But let's go back to your work now. Um, because that's more interesting, I think. Uh, how, what are your goals? What are your goals that you would like to accomplish with your work now? You have so many uh, fields that you're involved in. Do, do they come all together in your sort of uh, primo human uh, project? Is that the combination of your work or primo post human po project? Or, or is it, do you have another goal after it? How do you see the well, evolution of your work? I was just looking at something I wrote, and let me read it, and, and maybe this will help me focus. Um, since the 1980s, I have focused on, sorry, did I move that? Okay, focused on, since the 1980s, I have focused on human technology integration and the relationship between arts, design, and science. My theoretical activity is concerned with human enhancement and the methods for extending and expanding human capabilities through the media of nano, bio, info, cogno, techno sciences and within the artistic practice of visual, narrative, and biological arts toward the emergence of new and big plus media. So I think that kind of says it all right there. Um, my immediate work is to finish my dissertation. Um, I am also writing a book uh, with Max Moore on uh, transhumanism. It's an anthology, and uh, getting that done and out the door to publishers is a top priority. I would like to write more books and visuals. Um, I'd like to... Uh, even uh, take a look at my work over the years and put it together in a collection uh, that has a narrative with it that um, explores human enhancement and radical life extension and, and the whole um, computer-human integration. Uh, I don't think there's another area, another field that I'd like to get into other than probably brain science. And... I think maybe it would be great fun to do a postdoctorate in um, neuroscience or cognitive science um, from the perspective of, of design and human enhancement. I love teaching. I would love to spend more time uh, lecturing and teaching and actually chair a department on human enhancement and bring together the brilliant minds. I'm not a brilliant mind, but I would, I, I like to uh, catapult uh, brilliant minds together to problem solve. So I think that would be a great project. You know, thank you for inspiring me here. Um, I think that, yeah, I'd like to be, um, paid to, uh, just problem solve this whole human enhancement issue and the, and the major issues that will come about when, uh, say people want to stay 100% biological or 100% human and what will be the, the schism there, you know, what type of gaps will we need to deal with and also human rights with morphological freedom, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd like to, um, work on that. Great. So let me go a little bit one step further then and, and ask you, in terms of that human enhancement uh, issue and, and work, uh, what are your greatest hopes to, to see accomplished or to accomplish yourself? And what are your greatest fears? Okay. My greatest that I can accomplish or I'd like to see accomplished in the world? Either, either way. Uh, the greatest hope that I would like to accomplish would be to not die. <laughs> um, immortality? Um, no, I don't like the term immortality, radical life extension, and to evolve into um, 
other different types of forms where I'd have sub personas in different environments, maybe, you know, uh, multiple personas that I could send out in virtual environments in different environments. I think that would be the greatest performance art, greatest design project possible. Mm-hmm. So that is something that I, I would like very much to be involved in. Um, for um, the world, I think the what I would hope would occur is uh, humans gain a sense of real dignity and put down their arms and stop fighting and work towards uh, helping each other. Um, we can't rely on each individual to do that because so many humans have psychological problems. Sorry, I lost and the sound there. We, we can't rely we on... Uh, yeah, I think if I turn this way, it works. We can't rely on individuals to do this necessarily because most individuals, uh, most humans do have psychological problems of aggression and fears and uh, territoriality and one-upmanship and all the different things that, that is part of our reptilian brain or whatever part of our brain that, that causes us to, to have these psychological effects. Uh, I think that we need um, better organizations to actually get these things done outside of government. Government is too bureaucratic and it gets in the way a lot. Um, so I would like to live on a planet where, you know, there's some peace. <laughs> I mean, you know, stop this fighting and, and stupidity. Uh, that would be a dream come true. Um, that connects again to your uh, better distribution of food as like probably yes. the first and the most fundamental basic step towards that. And health care. And, you know, yeah. too many people in some of these developing countries that – don't have clean water, and it just is totally insane to me. I mean, that is insanity. How could so, we as a species feel comfortable going to sleep at night knowing this is occurring is beyond me. I don't feel good about it. So you so, think that technology can assist in, in resolving those issues? Oh, yes. I think that probably uh, nanotechnology and artificial general intelligence or smart AI uh, could certainly help with this. For one thing, um, a nanotechnology has uh, a lot of potential in the area of, you know, molecular manufacturing and desktop publishing mm-hmm. for, um, you know, actually building, putting molecules together to build certain um, products or structures or elements in nature that um, could uh, take care of these people. Um, so we need to make that a priority uh, it sounds so silly because you know, it, why aren't we doing it now? And I'm not the genius behind it. I don't know what to do, but you know, and I think that is, you know. What What is anyway, your greatest hard. fear on on the flip side of that? Oh, the greatest fear would be uh, runaway uh, nanotechnology and um, uh, gray goose scenario. Yeah, the gray goose scenario, right? And also. Um, Unfriendly super intelligence. I think that would be pretty scary. Um, having, if we develop AI and if it, uh, is not very friendly, uh, is, uh, has the, uh, psychology of humans that is, uh, that has psychology of I'm humans sorry, that is sound. emotionally inept. There? No. Sorry, that better? Oh. No. Okay. Let's there see. we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. I'll hold it like this for now. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Grey Goo. That that has cons- some concern. Um, uh, and you were speaking about uh, unfriendly AI as the other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think so. Um, say artificial general intelligence or super intelligence that uh, is like a um, uh, a machine that you know, goes off on its own, say if you're a farmer and you're, you know, your machine just starts going off on its own and it runs over you and, you know, or the blades, you know, cut off your arms or these things that happen, some of these horrible accidents that happen with machinery out in the fields of farmlands. So if you if you look at that and think, well, what if there was, you know, super intelligent machines, robotics that just went, you know, maniac, that would be pretty scary. Mm-hmm. But um, looking so in at that it, sense... I, in that sense, you believe in the singularity, then? Would that be fair to say? Uh, I don't... Uh, yes, well, uh, I look at it this way. The singularity, for me, is not a belief system. It's a technological event. It's uh, The singularity basically is 
uh, if and when super intelligence exceeds, far exceeds human level intelligence, mm-hmm. that the world would not be the same. And certainly, even if you look at it on a very um, small level, of course the world would not be the same because up until now, humans have been the highest intelligence on the planet. So we would have to step aside and accept that there was another intelligence that was smarter than us mm-hmm. and know better than us and make decisions, sorry, make decisions um, maybe without consulting us. So how would that affect our psyche? Not very well. So my view is, my particular philosophical view on this is that we would have to become the super intelligences, that I don't look at uh, superintelligence or, or AAGI being out there. I see it as being integrated into humans. So we would have to evolve. We'd have to bootstrap ourselves and become, you know, ex- you know, extreme transhumans. Well, maybe not extreme transhuman. We'd have to become um, late level transhuman into posthuman, and that so, would be the human condition. So the only way to survive the birth of AGI. Uh, and direct it in a safe end with respect to humanity would be to merge with it, basically. I think so. I don't think we'd have to merge 100% with all of it, but I think that that we're a competitive species. You know, we like sports, we like competing, and we like winning. And uh, we like our we like things the way we like it. That's human nature. Uh, we have good and we have we have not so good qualities, but I think that we are a competitive species. I think survival is innate in us. We'll do any we'll, we'll cut off our own arm if it's stuck in a in a doorway just to survive. So we will do what we need to do to survive and help each other survive. So I think that that'll be a decision we'll have to make. Um, it'd be like a, a vaccine, perhaps, uh, if you want to look at it. You know symbolically it'll be a vaccine to protect ourselves against a virus meaning intelligence being smarter than us so that yeah. almost sounds to me like inoculation from death or from from uh, aging right because when we merge with those technologies obviously we'll have the capabilities to extend life radically our mental uh, intellectual capacities will be extended equally so it's almost that kind of a vaccination that would prevent death and, and aging. It's, it's very interesting. Um, let me see. Uh, how do you rate our chances of surviving the singularity then? Because I'm always surprised. I interview all kinds of people, such as, for example, Michael Anisimov, Kevin Kelly, Aubrey de Grey, uh, Kevin Warwick. And I'm always surprised by the kinds of uh, answers people give me in terms of chances. Like, for example, Michael Anisimov gave me 25% in his opinion that humanity will survive a singularity. Um, Kevin Warwick said, well, if you're talking about in human form, I'd say less than 1%. If you're talking about in a sort of cyborg type, like merged machine human form, I'd say very high, like 75, 80%. So for him, there's no other way. For him, humanity is doomed. And for us, the only way to survive is, as you said, to merge with them, at least to some degree. So what would you rate our chances of survival? I would rate our chances of survival um, 80% plus. And maybe that's um, a bit optimistic, but I'm a rational optimist. I base my supposition on the knowledge that the human species is a species which will do whatever it takes to survive. So I think if push comes to shove, we will do whatever it takes to survive and keep our species alive and going. And if we have to um, merge and uh, evolve beyond the human uh, biology, the human genome, and uh, merge with uh, the machine, I think that that would be the post-human. And I don't see it as a cyborg. I think that the term cyborg ought to be left with cyborg. A cyborg is a man, machine, human machine, and has a great history, and it's a wonderful word, and it's very similar to transhuman. But uh, transhuman is a self-directed evolution. A cyborg has um, no psychology with it. Um, Donna Haraway certainly created the Cyborg Manifesto, but that's based on feminism and ideology. 
um, not based on biology and life extension or a fighting disease or, or any of the issues of transhumanism. So I think that we'll become more transhuman and we'll have to become posthuman or whatever other term we designate for this um, singularity uh, leap uh, to survive. So I'd say greater than, what did I say, 70, 80%? 80%. I say 80%. I say 80%. Yeah. So, Natasha, I have heard you discuss um, the issue of, de- uh, of death on several occasions, and what really surprised me there was that you were talking about death as a potential for a vacation uh, or something that is optional and that we could choose to either take temporarily or not. Uh, would you mind elaborating on that? Sure. Historically, death has been a consequence of life. If you're alive, you die. And it has been accepted as a given that we live to a certain amount of time chronologically and then our body goes into states of apoptosis or cell degeneration and we are diseased and we die. With the advent of biotechnology and nanomedicine and artificial intelligence and other um, methodologies for the uh, purpose or function of extending life, we have to take a look at uh, what would it mean to live well beyond 122 years or what would it mean to live um, into 200 years. And not only that, when we consider the uh, research and development into building non-biological bodies or forms to uh, exist within with our, our brain, gray matter, and our um, consciousness, our personhood, we're taking a look at living well beyond biology standards. Uh, further, when we take a look at virtual reality and enhanced reality and other uh, methods for uh, existence outside of biology, there is no time frame that is established so far. So what does this mean to life and existence? Well, we may get to a point where we want to es- not escape from life, but um, relax from it or take a vacation from it, meaning that we may want to go into a suspended um state of existence, like um, I guess the best analogy would be like a coma, but not as an ill health, but as a, um, a sleep, a deep sleep. So these types of um, uh, existences could establish a redefinition of death, where death is not an absolute uh, end of existence, but a, um, a type of um, uh, organ of existence where we would take off for a day, a month, say five, ten years, um, or we could stop existence within one substrate or one form and continue existence in another form. So it would be something similar to, as you said, either coma or maybe a cryogenic sleep of a sort or like deep freeze maybe where all the cells are sus- in a suspended animation for a much longer than usual? Yes. Um, looking at it psychologically, it would be a vacation from having to exist. Um, oftentimes we hear people say they look forward to death, meaning that they can relax from the pressures of life or the pressures from existing in life. So I don't think that we should eliminate that um, that desire to drop out of life, but maybe find that as a whole new a set of realities um, with which to um, explore. I suppose it would be more like... Um, a deep sleep or a deep meditation or just dropping out for a decade or two if if we live for hundreds of years, for example. I will bring our interview to a close today with uh, the last two questions. And the first one of them would be, for those of our viewers who haven't heard anything about you and would like to learn more, where would you recommend that they would go and look? Do you have a website or a blog or a point of reference that they can search for more information from? Uh, yes, I have a website. It's very simple. It's natasha.cc. And uh, so it's a www.natasha.cc. And the CC, I look at it as a carbon copy of myself. But basically what it is, it's the coconut islands off of Australia. So um, another place to look is, is Wikipedia. 
uh, someone put up a page on me, so that's kind of fun to look at. And if you just Google Natasha Vitamore, uh, that's a V-I-T-A hyphen M-O-R-E, uh, there are numerous uh, websites that do carry my uh, talks, uh, presentations, and uh, debates, and um, a lot of press material that's easy to locate. Excellent. Also, oh, I have a column in Nanotechnology Now, uh, which I write usually on a monthly basis, and I have a new column up right now on We Are Strong. So that's kind of fun, looking at um, artificial general intelligence and enhancing the body and possible singularity. Fantastic. So uh, if there is one message that you would like to leave us with today to give to our viewers to take away from this interview, what would you like that message to be? Be strong. <laughs> Keep on living. Enjoy life to the fullest. Surround yourself with positive, healthy people who actually care about you. Uh, find a passion in life, a purpose, and just love. It's as simple as that. The heavier issues, which I think we all need to pay attention to, are the ones that look at where are we going in the future, how are we going to deal with planetary problems, starvation, death, lack of clean water around the world. We already discussed this. Um, those are big issues, big problems that I don't think we will be able to solve uh, less and until we have artificial general intelligence to assist our cognition. We're just not smart enough to deal with the magnitude of the issues. But on a personal basis, an individual basis for each person, uh, just live and enjoy enjoy life as much as possible while contributing to your passion, your purpose. Thank you very much for being on Singularity One on One today, Natasha. It's been fascinating to have you here. Thank you. I've enjoyed it enormously, and thank you for presenting such interesting questions. I appreciate it.